Charles Alexander here bringing you Jeff Thomas, founder of Arcos Global fin uh, Global Advisors, where they have uh, been going since 2017. This is a really sharp firm. They've got four locations headquartered in Houston. Jeff came from a storied career at Morgan Stanley, where he was named to every top advisor list known to mankind, won all the awards, but decided to strike out on his own. He's also an author, trading up, moving from su success to significance on Wall Street, and has recently started a podcast, Generous Business Owner Podcast. So, hey, thank you for joining me. And Jeff, how are you doing, friend? Well, thanks for having me, Charles. So it looks like you're a Cardinals fan. <laughs> that, that is accurate. I grew up in St. Louis. Well, so I'm uh, trying to maintain my uh, loyalties, much to the chagrin of my uh, Houston friends. I'll bet. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about kind of how you got started uh, in St. Louis and, and to where you are now. Yeah, my uh, my dad was a uh, a business guy, uh, engineer, MBA, uh, and then in his late twenties, uh, he was going to church, and uh, the senior pastor asked him if he's ever thought about. Uh, going to seminary and uh, he said yes and uh, I always joke with my dad that he probably asked everybody that but he finally got a yes out of somebody. That's right. And uh, anyway uh, my, my dad ended up writing his uh, doctoral thesis on uh, how to run the church more efficiently uh, uh, using business principles he'd learned. And, right. uh, and so he kind of became Mr. Fix-It for the Presbyterian Church and uh, landed in St. Louis uh, with a big church there, and and uh, that's where uh, mostly I grew up. And so, uh, you know, I kind of grew up thinking, uh, well, I didn't feel called to work for the church or go to seminary or any of that stuff. Uh, always had a strong faith, but um, I felt really identified with his business buddies better. Sure, you know, I just thought it's all kind of I felt. Yeah, and I just thought. Well, uh, I guess what do you do if you're in business? Uh, I guess you just go to church, be a good person, and uh, you know, use your money to support the people doing the heavy lifting, sure. uh, the missionaries. And the... So I didn't really think of myself really as uh, uh, being in uh, ministry, uh, but that all kind of changed later because I just sort of put my head down and did the business thing, but I kind of hit a wall. And uh, maybe we can we can talk about that. You know, sure. it's a bit of a turning point. You know. So you, you got to a point, you got to see what your dad was doing, uh, and you you didn't necessarily get Phil called to, into the ministry, but tell, tell us about your beginning into the world of being a financial advisor and, and what that background you had as a kid uh, did for you leading up to that. That's, that's, a, that's actually an insightful question because these, these you know, these, his, these backstories do matter, right? Oh, yeah. The way we look at the world and why we choose certain things, and sometimes... You're not even aware of them until you kind of look back and go, oh. Yeah. <laughs> that's how it, so, as a financial advisor, I'm sure you play part uh, psychiatrist as well. Exactly. So uh, we see a lot. So, you know, for me, uh, uh, you know, I was always kind of a math guy. So and I wanted something practical because I had to help pay for college. Sure. So I needed to get a job. Uh, so I thought, well, OK. Uh started engineering, but I was really going to a liberal arts school. That really wasn't their specialty. So I switched over to accounting, but that was practical. So I, I got a job with uh, Arthur Anderson right out of college uh, in Houston. I went to Trinity in San Antonio. And uh, but so I stayed in Texas and uh, uh, that was great. Uh, a lot of really smart people, but I didn't love being locked in a closet. I had enough numbers. Sure. So uh, I had audited a broker dealer and I uh, didn't know anything about that business uh, until then. But then Payne Weber, a uh, recruiter called and said, hey, would you like to be an auditor for uh, for Payne Weber, which is now bought by UBS 20, 22 years ago. Uh, but I, I took that job. So uh, we had an office in Houston that was kind of to audit the Western 150 offices of Payne Weber at that time. and. Uh, and I really learned the business, did that for about two and a half years. So a couple of years of public accounting, a couple of years uh, doing that. But I thought I was in 150 of these offices. I thought, man, these advisors are having a lot more fun than I am. Yeah. You know, they, do, they get to deal half the time with people. I'm sort of half social, half technical. And so that's kind of a good fit uh, for, for an advisor. So that's that. And I kind of got to know the business from them. So I would just interview the best advisors. Sure. And say, well, what are, 
them kind of the best practices before I launch, and uh, they were kind enough to share those things. And so we kind of hit the ground running and uh, in 95 as an advisor and uh, built it up there. And then uh, uh, a team there at, at Payne Weber in Houston, and then we uh, moved it over to Morgan Stanley in 2000 and spent 17 years there. But, uh, you know, learned a lot of things along the way. So what at Morgan Stanley, I know you had a lot of success there. Yeah. What at, at what point did you look at what you were doing and say, I, I should be, I should be out on my own. Yeah. Well, there were a couple of, uh, there were a couple of turning points when, when we made that transition to Morgan Stanley, you know, uh, they, they, they pay a lot of money to switch firms. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, you know, uh, I got this big check from Morgan Stanley when I was, you know, in my early thirties and, you know, I thought it would excite me more than it did. Right. I thought, you know, this is kind of Charles. I thought, you know, this is kind of the American dream, right? Aren't we supposed to work hard, right. pure and work ethic and, you know, make our own way. And then, you know, you make a bunch of money, hopefully you're generous with it, all that kind of stuff. But I just, it didn't do it for me and I couldn't figure out what was wrong. And I kept saying like, I just can't, I don't know, maybe I need to switch careers. Sure. I just can't make rich people richer. I'm, I'm just, it's, it's not turning. And I couldn't figure out. And so I, I even started reading all these world religion books because I was like, am I just a, a Christian because my dad was, you know, or my parents, you know? So I started reading all these things. And then I read The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, where he was a staunch atheist and researched it and, and became a believer. He was an investigative reporter for the, uh, uh, Chicago Tribune, and now he's become a good friend. That's a whole nother podcast we could do. Sure. But, but he, he uh, I read that book and it really helped me. I mean, this guy was way more skeptical than I was. I was like, all right, all right. Gonna, I thought maybe there's some answers in the Bible. I'll, I'll go see if I can find out what's wrong with me and start doing a bunch of Bible study. I did this thing called Bible Study Fellowship that a lot of people, uh, Bible study nerds know, but it was just kind of a daily Bible study and a weekly class and did that for seven years. But a couple of years into that, it, I figured out what my problem was and what that book revealed to me was that I was chasing money, little G God money. More right. than I was chasing the big G God and it was not a pretty picture. And I, I wouldn't have told you that when I first entered this sort of season of discontent. Right. But that's what uh, was revealed to me. And I really repented of that, man. It took me about five years of just trying to reorder things. And my wife and I started giving away more money. She's always been more generous. Sure. More, She's always been ahead of me on all of this stuff. So I was just catching up to her, frankly. But long story short, uh, in 2007, uh, I had found this organization called Kingdom Advisors uh, that helps advisors implement biblical wisdom into their practice. And uh, the guy that founded it, Ron Blue, he said, hey, will you be a coach? We're going to start this coaching program and fly everybody into Atlanta, you know, for 24 hours, once a quarter for three years. Will you be a coach? I said, well, I'll be a coach, but... I'm as much a player as I'm a coach, 2007, you know, this was 15 years ago. And uh, I said, how, how about you mentor me or disciple me in the mornings? Right. Now we'll go, I'll, I'll help you do that thing. And he, he, did, he generously did that for me for three years. And our last session together, Charles, and this is kind of why I wrote that book, Trading Up, just really for this moment that I'm about to share with you uh, and, and, and the folks listening in. But he, I remember he said, you know, I started this firm. And he goes, everything I start gets bigger and better after I leave. You know, he's a visionary, not an operator. He, he's the first one to tell you that. And he goes, I can't believe this little wealth management company I started has, you know, 15 offices, 50 million in revenue. And I was like, I heard God speak to me the way I've never heard it before or since. So clear, he, I felt like he said, I want you to scale what this guy started. Wow. And I go, well, I remember shooting back in my brain. Actually, I asked Ryan, did you hear that? <laughs> I actually looked over my shoulder. I was like, Maybe that was for somebody else in the sure. coffee shop. There's nobody else there, so I knew it was for me. And he goes, no, I didn't hear it. And I, so I shot back kind of mentally. I was like, okay, God, but that sounds cool because I was on all these committees at Morgan Stanley. I had a lot of opinions about how the business should be run, but uh, uh, but I only had five people on my team. I said, right. God, you said scale. I, I don't know how to scale anything. It sounds fun, but I don't know how to scale anything. And, he, and I remember he shot back to me. I felt like God saying back to me, he goes, I know, I'll do it. And you just wake up and take instructions and make sure you give me the credit. And uh, so I've been doing that. That was 2010. I've been doing that for the last 12 years. Now, what he didn't say is start your own firm. Okay. Uh, he just said, scale this thing. Well, all right. We already had this little, I'd start this Christian focus group with about 150 uh, 
other advisors at Morgan Stanley, and uh, I was hosting a little conference call every month, that sort of thing. I thought, okay, I, I'll throw myself into this, get that group formally recognized by the firm. Let's see if we can change the culture of an already scaled business. Oof, how was that? Well, <laughs> uh, you already know the end of it. Right. I thought this was brilliant, uh, but it didn't work. I spent six years pounding my head against the wall on that deal. And I'm actually not mad at Morgan Stanley about it. It's just the way the world operates. It's a publicly traded company. We did get the group recognized. We got it up to 600 advisors. Right. But the bigger we got, you know, we had a brochure with Bible verses in it, and I, I sent a digital copy to all for our team, to all other 600 members in, the, in print media. They got inundated with requests, and they banned Bible verses from all print. It was just too much. Sure. They're just like, no, we're not, you know, you know, it's one little you in the corner, it's fine. But it, so anyway, it was a lot of little things like that that led us to realize that we really needed to start our own firm to do things the way we felt called to do them. And so, that's what we did in 2017. And man, I'll tell you what, nothing's been more fun than starting this thing. So the, I think one of the bigger takeaways that you have right there is that this wasn't just an overnight, not just not an overnight success. It wasn't even an overnight decision. And you'll hear that so many times, and not just uh, from a Christian standpoint where somebody says they had a testimony. And you'll see see that a lot, quite a bit from the pulpit where you've got the guest speaker come in and they had this bright, shiny oh, moment and you know, they had their own burning bush or road to Damascus experience, but the rest of us, uh, you know, in this, even for folks that don't consider themselves a Christian, when they yeah. have that turning point, it's, it's that, uh, you know, Facebook meme where, you know, success doesn't look like this. It looks like, you know, a squiggly line and yours, you're sounding like it squiggled over uh, almost a decade there at least. Oh, and, and it's still squiggling, huh? uh, you know, I always like to think about, hey, you know, like Moses was with uh, the Israelites 40 years. And if you look at the map, they just like did circles. They, just, they absolutely did. Like, oh, I always pray, God, please don't make me do 40 years of circles, you know. But but I, I don't really, you know, at the same time, you know, you, you sort of follow this process. And, and literally my, my process these days is I just wake up and take instructions. I'm just trying to get a little bit better every day, a little more obedient. Sure. And I always tell the team, I go, you know. All of my ideas are garbage, actually, okay? And all of God's ideas are amazing. But but luckily, we're listening to his. The key is just to listen. So I get up, and he'll sort of right. orchestrate things, and I'm just trying to pay attention to what he's orchestrating instead of just ignoring that and trying to drive on my own agenda. So to me, um, we're still on that path, you know? And I think, uh, you know, uh, we're adding advisors. We have a vision to build a you know, a national platform. Uh, we want to be in the, you know, he said scale, right? So I'm just following that that playbook and asking him what to do. So we're looking for advisors to join us that want to do it this way are all over the country. And, uh, you know, I think 10 years from now that people will look back and go, oh man, that Arcos, that's a that's an overnight success. Well, tell <laughs> and they, they won't listen to this podcast. Right. This, this has been already a 20 year journey plus another 30, uh, you know, coming. So, uh, it's, it's, uh, you're, you're exactly right. It, it, I don't believe anybody that thinks success is a straight line up into the right. Sure. Not. Well, tell me a little bit about that. Then you guys have been, you know, it 2017 is a short period of time for you to already have four locations. What have you done at this point? That's got, got you to scale as uh, well as you have so far. <laughs> All right, man. I wish I could tell you, this is just plays into what we were just talking about. Okay. My idea, Charles, I had this very simple business plan. I said, all right, God said, scale it. We're going to, you know, vision, build the ideal God honoring wealth management company. The mission statement is to uh, help families thrive across generations by connecting their money with their purpose. I'm like, okay, from kingdom advisors, about 3000 members, I kind of know who the big players are in that world you know i know they probably are aligned with what we're going to do i'll just go to the you know 30 plus nfl cities and i'll uh, i'll just go down the list of the top three sort of christian advisors in each city that i know and man they're gonna be so excited to jump on this bus huh? you know we're gonna build the chick-fil-a of wealth management i mean yeah i mean i may i don't know if i have room for all three of them in each city okay and uh, all i got was crickets okay Charles, i got crickets and I get it at these big firms where we came from, man. I mean, God had to pry me out of that seat with all the deferred. They're good at the golden handcuffs. Sure. They're good at it. And uh, so, look, I think a lot of those people will join us down the road, but uh, that, that really didn't work. I'll tell you what did work. 
um, stuff that I didn't control. I mean, I'll give you an example. I was on a podcast like this. A guy in uh, New Jersey is listening to this with a big firm, and and uh, uh, he tells me uh, he calls me after the podcast. I don't know this guy from Adam. He's not You're a member of King Advisors. Great guy calls me and uh, he goes, I was looking at your website. He, 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 I said that line that I said earlier in this, you know, where I said, hey, not, I don't want to just make rich people richer. I guess he had been saying that to his wife. He's got this sort of discomfort like I sure. had all those years ago. And anyway, he looks at our website. He's all interested. Maybe we should do that. And, and, our, and the guy that runs our New York office was discipled by his father 30 years ago. Wow. And there's like 20 million people in the metro sure. area. And they like... Okay, so uh, we everybody who's come to us has been introduced by the most unlikely source. It wasn't my master plan. Sure. So somebody's probably going to listen to this and, and call me, and they'll go, I, "I'm in Tennessee. Yeah, I've never met. I've never even heard of you." But so anyway, uh, God just does it. Uh, he just constantly surprises us in. I believe he's preparing the hearts of people, and my job is just to do this, get the word out sure. about what we're doing, so and, what, uh, and and do it differently. So, what's part of the way that you guys continue to get the word out? I know that uh, you know you got a, your your website's awesome; it's very clear cut. You've got a multitude of advisors. Are you providing uh, any kind of and it's a buzzword, but any kind of educational content marketing? Are you doing? I mean, you're not, you, you guys aren't the doing, you know, seminars at O'Charlie's and hoping enough people show up that you can shake the numbers out. You're doing it differently. So what, what part of that uh, different uh, that continues to make you guys attractive is something that y you feel like you're doing on a consistent basis? Well, I know you're kind of an expert on the marketing side and uh, we do not profess uh, to, to have that all figured out, sure. but I'll tell you what, um, it, you know, my ability to do even this interview uh, when you're at a big firm, probably tough. I mean, you'd have to submit the questions, what yep. the answer is going to be. Compliance, and again, this is just a fact of a, of a big firm. Compliance manages to the lowest common denominator. So if you got 15,000 advisors, how do you control what they're all saying on a podcast? Right. Okay. It's, it's, I understand the challenge. I'm not throwing stones. It's just a hard challenge. So, you, so they basically prevent it. I mean, that's what you do uh, to make sure you don't have a problem. So having our own firm has been just a breath of fresh air to be able to do this kind of thing, produce our own content. I produce, a, we do a lot of video work. Uh, just, we, we, we have amazing people that I've told you to get mm -hmm. Like, I'm not convincing them to come. Sure. They're seeing this vision we have and like, that's exactly what God's telling me to do. And they want to join with a smart team with a unique culture. Uh, serving big clients and grow. I mean, so those are kind of our our big uniques. Sure. So they have content. We have different departments. They're geniuses at client advice or client experience or marketing or whatever. And we just encourage them, you know, get a little iPhone holder and a red yeah. light and shoot a 20 second video. I mean, it's not that hard, but be consistent with it. That's right. And uh, so we love uh, the digital marketing stuff. I love the stuff uh, you're doing. I, I just think, I think it's table stakes. Uh, those are only th those are the people that are going to grow up are the people who engage in that. I don't think you can have a 2002 website sitting there just with a phone number on it and never produce any right. content. I mean, I, that, that, that ship has sailed. And I think th there are a lot of big companies, you know, the big companies can spend on the national brand. But I think as a smaller company, man, use your size to your advantage, actually. Uh, and produce this unique stuff. Anyway, I'd love to hear your perspective. Well, no, I think you hit the nail on the head as much or more than anything else. And it's about consistency and it doesn't even yeah. have to be the top of the line, the best. And what you are telling your people and anybody that's, you know, watching, listening, the, when, when he's saying, turn the little camera on and just get going the first five or 10 that you do, you're not going to be happy with. And I have so many financial advisors that tell me, well, I don't like writing. I don't, I'm not good at writing. I'm not good at camera. I'm not good at this. I'm not good at that. Everything needs to be client referrals and center of influence driven, which is hundred percent correct. But how do you get some of those? You can't do it hiding behind, like you said, that Netscape 1.0 2002 website that's got merely uh, some old stock footage on it. You have to make that effort and it's ugly at first. And as long as you, you're willing to commit to it, 
people are drawn to that as long as you're a person that's able, as long as you're a person that's uh, referable, so to speak. You know, if if you're authenticity, right, Charles? I mean, all you gotta be hundred percent. They don't. I can't stand. I shoot a lot of stuff. I can't stand listening to myself. I can't stand watching myself. But it doesn't offend anybody else. That's right. That's just our own neuroses, right? Uh, I don't mind writing. Uh, I don't mind doing any of it. I just don't like. Ugh. I just I'm so critical of myself. I'm not critical of other people. I love their stuff. And if they stumble, I'm not mad at them. It makes them more human. That's correct. Hundred so percent correct. I, I just think it, I think you, I love your idea about it. just get started, do something. Yep. Yeah, there's so many there's so many accomplished actors or TV personalities that still don't watch themselves that are pros at it. So we don't we don't need to be able to uh, enjoy it ourselves. It's not for us. There you go, Jinx. You owe me a Coke. Yeah, exactly. Well, Jeff, t- uh, I'll start uh, getting us toward the uh, end of this thing here. I know your time's valuable. You got places to go and people to see. Kind of, uh, and this will be a little off off target here. What is you know, what does your morning routine look like uh, before you get up and going? Because it sounds like you you've got a thousand things going on, and I'm sure you're not you're not just up and taking off without thinking through the day. What are you doing? Well, that's it. I'm glad you asked that. Actually, um, we we have on that generous uh, business owner podcast. I've got a couple of co-hosts, and and uh, we all kind of interviewed each other for the first <laughs> kind of practicing on each other. Yeah. So to kind of tell the audience our story and. Uh, you know, one of the things we try to do on that uh, podcast is at the end of it, we say, hey, what's one practical tip that you would give other business owners who uh, would like to be generous and that, and that sort of thing? And uh, when uh, Jeff Rowe was interviewing me, I actually talked about my morning routine and, and okay. suggesting that as, the, as my practical tip uh, to, to anybody out there. And for me, um, remember, I told you that story about like, I really tried to do this thing by myself in my on my way uh, in my own way for 10 years in this business. And I had some worldly success, but not really uh, any significance. I was kind of just empty because I was just trying to I was trying to do the right thing for sure. people. But I was I, like I, I used to say, but we're right on their heels, you know, I right. Was counting every dollar. Uh, and so, you know, for the last 20 years, I really just laid that down and try to be on God's agenda, which has been a lot more fun. He's so much more creative, so much more generous, thinking about other people and getting off of my own agenda. And uh, so, and remember the deal we made, uh, he gave me this vision for the scaling something in this industry in 2010. It's been 12 years. Uh, and remember, I told him I didn't know how to do it. And, right. Uh, Cause I really, I hadn't scaled anything. And, uh, and he said, I'll just wake up and take instructions. So I'm taking him at his word. I do that every single morning. Uh, I get up and, uh, you know, I, I do this little quiet time. You know, it's popular in our culture to call it meditation. Sure. It's not meditation for me. It's frankly, I call it quiet time. That's a little more of the Christian term. Maybe. You're listening. That's all I'm doing, man. And I'll, I do a little, I'll read some little devotional or a little book I got going just to get a little scripture, a little word in my head. It's amazing how it hits you at different places. And then I get on my knees and pray. And I, I, uh, I kind of do ACTS, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and then supplication. Because I want to get to the supplication. I want to ask for stuff when I wake up. Right. But those other letters kind of slow me down and get my head right. And then I just, I just thank him for the day before and uh, pray my calendar. I uh, prayed about our podcast today. And uh and and help us just reflect uh, reflect what he wants us to talk about, and uh, and it really takes the pressure off, man. So I, f- I feel my I wake up with a thousand things going in my brain like we all do with a to do list and what do I mm, where do I need to be what do I need to say, and whenever I do that, it just I just lay it all on him, and and uh, my blood pressure comes down, and I think I'm more present, I'm yeah. on other people's agenda more, and uh, uh, it just tends to go better, man. It's so, amazing yeah. what that that quiet time can do to help release all of the uh, junk drawer mentality we have of a thousand things going on, and it makes it easier on you to focus. Exactly. I like that junk drawer. That's how I feel. And, I mean, and yeah. I, I guarantee you I'm not the only one. If you get somebody walking down the street listening to this that, uh, uh, you know, is waking up at 2.13 in the morning making a little list. Sure. 
three times a week. You know, we're all doing that stuff. So I wake up to that little thing. Oh yeah, I wrote those three things down right. in the middle of the night. You know, and kind of laying all that down and starting fresh, kind of wipe the slate clean. You know. Well, Jeff, I appreciate your time. I don't want to belabor uh, any more. You've been super generous. Tell any, uh, if you don't mind sharing, how can somebody uh, get in contact with you? Sure. Uh, they can just email me, uh, jeff.thomas at arcosglobal.com, A-R-K-O-S, uh, global.com. I'm happy to speak to any of uh, your listeners. Good deal. Hey, friend, I appreciate the time today. Thanks, Charles. Thank you. All right.